Cop pulls over a car, but his life changes when the driver rolls down her window. The Orlando police stopped a white Ford Fusion with tinted windows on June 19th in the evening. Aramis Ayala, Florida's first and only African-American state attorney, was present inside. It appears that the two cops who stopped her were unaware of this. According to body cam footage of the traffic stop, Ayala already has her driver's license in her hands when one officer approaches her car. As he checks Ayala's license, the officer inquires, What agency are you with? She answers, I'm a state attorney. The officer appears to abruptly halt the traffic stop by saying, State attorney, well, thanks for that. Your tag wasn't returned. Never before seen that. We're all set now. The officer explains further that nothing was found after they ran Ayala's Florida license plate tag since she seemed perplexed. What was the purpose of the tag run, Ayala presses. The officer replies, well, we run tags all the time. That's how we determine whether cars are stolen and stuff like that. The windows were also rather gloomy. The fact that I lack a tint measure is additional justification for the pause. Ayala smiles a little and asks for the policeman's business cards after mentioning the dark windows. Despite the fact that the event happened last month, it has come under investigation in the last week as a result of local media, sources publishing body camera footage of the stop and raising the possibility that Ayala was racially profiled. Florida National News claimed that the state attorney was a victim of racial profiling by Orlando police despite being one of the most well-known state attorneys in Florida before listing five main things wrong with this traffic stop. Outspoken black rights activist and New York Daily News columnist Sean King posted the video on his social media sites on Tuesday where it received hundreds of thousands of views and generated more conversation about the event. King posted on Facebook that Aramis Ayala is the most powerful and most important individuals in their legal system since she is Florida's first and only African-American state's attorney. It didn't stop the cops from pulling her over for no apparent reason and then attempting to justify their actions. The stop was justified, according to the Orlando Police Department, which also pointed out that patrol officers frequently run tags for official business only. The agency said in a statement that because of the dark window tint, which is visible in the video, officers would not have been able to determine who or how many passengers were in the car. The complaint regarding this traffic stop has not been made. Ayala agreed that the traffic stop, which happened while she was returning from giving a session at Florida A&M University College of Law, appeared to be compliant with Florida law but she stated that she planned to speak with Orlando police about the event. She also disputed that she had filed a lawsuit concerning the traffic stop and said that there had been a flood of misinformation ever since a public records request led to the publication of the footage. Let me be clear. I broke no laws. Although being private, the license plate was registered correctly and still is. The color was not in any way against Florida law, according to Iala's statement. I want to see law enforcement and the community working together in a positive and courteous way. I'm eager to have an honest discussion about how this incident affects that objective with the chief of the Orlando Police Department when we sit down. Pinellas Sheriff's Office Sergeant Spencer Gross told the Tampa Bay Times that examining tags during patrols was a vital tool in law enforcement. Ayala represents Orange and Osceola counties as state attorney for Florida's Ninth Judicial Circuit Court. She became Florida's first African-American state attorney after being elected in November. When Ayala announced in March that her office would no longer seek the death penalty in murder cases, Governor Rick Scott, Republican, was forced to reassign all of Ayala's murder cases to another prosecutor. Last month, the case made it to the Florida Supreme Court. Ayala stated during a news conference in March, I have given this matter great and thorough thought and consideration. The process has made it clearly evident that although I currently have the option to seek the death penalty, I have decided that doing so is not in the community's or justice's best interests. In another incident, a black off-duty cop tried to help stop a crime. Another officer shot him. A friendly fire incident in which an off-duty St. Louis policeman was shot while coming to the aid of fellow officers has taken on racial overtones as a result 
of an incendiary claim made by the injured officer's attorney. The officer was viewed as a threat because he was black. The incident occurred while the policeman was helping his fellow officers. The St. Louis Police Department has not disclosed the identities of any of the officers who were engaged in the incident that took place on Wednesday night. The white police officer was the one who shot the off-duty officer. As the agency continues to investigate what took place, all seven officers involved have been placed on administrative leave. According to the interim police chief, Lawrence O'Toole, who spoke with reporters on Thursday, it is known that officers working with an anti-crime task force were tracking a car that had been stolen from the Maryland Heights community after its license plate had been detected by an automatic reader on Wednesday night. Throughout the course of the pursuit, the individuals who were armed and were inside the automobile opened fire. During the subsequent exchange of gunfire, police officers returned fire, wounding one of the men in the ankle with their bullet. According to the police, the vehicle ultimately crashed in a residential area located on the northern part of the city, and the occupants of the vehicle leapt out and ran away. Both the man who was shot in the ankle and the youngster who was apprehended after a brief chase were taken into custody without delay. A third suspect, who police thought to be armed, managed to flee the scene and was still at large as of Sunday. After hearing the disturbance, an off-duty police officer who lives in the area quickly grabbed his service gun and raced to the location to aid the other policemen there. As he arrived, the other officers were in the process of arresting the suspect. The other policemen initially commanded the off-duty officer to get down on the ground, but then they realized that he was a fellow officer and told him to get back up and approach them. According to the Associated Press, while the off-duty cop approached the suspect, Another officer arrived and shot him in the arm, claiming that he apparently did not recognize the suspect. After receiving treatment at the hospital, the black cop, who is 38 years old and has been with the force for 11 years, was discharged from the facility. An officer who had been on the police for eight years was 36 years old at the time of the shooting, told investigators that he had been afraid for his own safety. But the attorney for the black officer, Rufus Tate Jr., disputed the claim, stating that his client had complied with all of the other officers' commands and had never posed a danger to anyone. According to what he said to a Fox affiliate in St. Louis called KTVI, in the police record, you have so far there is no description of threat he received. Consequently, this presents quite the challenge for us. But this topic has been front and center in conversations on a national scale for the past two years. There is a widespread preconception that people will instinctively be afraid of a black man. Tate stated that the incident was an instance of a black professional in law enforcement, himself being shot and treated like an ordinary black guy in the street. Tate was referring to himself as the victim in the incident. This is a really significant issue. The region around St. Louis was once a focal point of a discussion that is still taking place across the country, about whether or not police are too ready to use fatal force against minority groups. According to the Associated Press, on Tuesday, a federal judge granted Michael Brown's parents a compensation of $1.5 million for their son's death. Darren Wilson, a white police officer, fatally shot unarmed teen Michael Brown on August 9, 2014, during a confrontation in Ferguson, Missouri, roughly 20 minutes outside of St. Louis. Brown was 18 years old at the time. After Michael Brown was shot, there were several months of subsequent protests. In the end, an inquiry conducted by the Justice Department found evidence of prejudice in that criminal justice system in Ferguson, despite the fact that Wilson was never charged with a crime. In November 2014, Wilson tendered his resignation and Brown's parents filed a lawsuit against the city. Yet, the killing of Brown was only one of many occurrences of this kind. Philandro Castile was killed by a police officer in Minnesota during the summer of 2016 after the officer pulled him over for a broken brake light. And just recently, a police officer from North Charleston entered a guilty plea to a federal civil rights charge related to the shooting death of an unarmed driver named Walter Scott, who was 50 years old. Scott was fleeing from the officer when the officer shot and killed him. 
According to a database maintained by the Washington Post that tracks police killings, 461 people have been shot and killed by law enforcement officials so far in 2018. One in every four of them was of African descent. In 2016, police officers were responsible for the deaths of 963 persons. Black people made up 24% of the total. According to a continuing research by the Washington Post, police shoot and kill more than 1,000 individuals year on average in the United States. A Post investigation into the shooting death of unarmed black man Michael Brown by Ferguson, Missouri Police in 2014 revealed that the number of fatal police shootings reported to the FBI was more than half underreported. The distance between them has grown recently. By 2021, only a third of department's fatal shootings appeared in the FBI database. This is largely due to the fact that local police forces are not compelled to notify the federal authorities of these instances. And revised FBI reporting system and misunderstandings regarding reporting responsibilities among local law enforcement further exacerbate the issue. The Post started keeping track of every individual shot and killed in the United States by a police officer while they were on duty in 2015 as part of its investigation. Reporters have since tallied thousands of fatalities. The Post modified its database in 2022 to standardize and make public the identities of the police departments involved in each shooting in order to improve the departmental accountability.